Please download a PDF of this show's five-page program at www.steinbeckshow.com. To proceed now past the 15-minute pre-show to the stage performance, skip ahead to 15 minutes and 25 seconds. That said, the pre-show is pretty sweet. You're in the right place, friend, and everything's just ducky here at a quarter till 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Stay tuned for our 7 p.m. live performance of John Steinbeck, Scribe of Social Conscience. You've still got time to go iron your laces. Please enjoy our pre-show program. Three songs and a moving pictures trailer, all calling out for social justice. First up, the song Buffalo Dreams by Bunny Sings Wolf, performed by her and Paul McComas. Wasn't that just berries? Buffalo Dreams by Bunny Sings Wolf, performed by her and Paul McComas. Stay tuned for the live show, John Steinbeck, Scribe of Social Conscience. It doesn't start till 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, so you've still a while to pour yourself a shot of giggle water, or heat up the kettle for a cup of noodle juice. Here now is the trailer for Sean Baker's buffo and quite moving, moving picture from 2017, The Florida Project. Okay, I warned you, one drip and you're out. Oh, come on! Out now. It's gonna melt outside. It's melting inside, too. But Bobby... Out. Thank you very much. You're not welcome! The man who lives in here gets arrested a lot. These are the rooms we're not supposed to go in. But let's go anyway. Could you give us some change, please? The doctor said we 
have asthma and we gotta eat ice cream yeah. right away. Here you go. Hey, Lee, got a situation here. Open up. It's only second week of the summer, and there's already been a dead fish in the pool. We're trying to get it back alive. Water balloons thrown at tourists. Boobies! Boobies! I failed as a mother, Moni. You yeah, Mom, <laughs> you're a disgrace. New job? Yeah. If you're working, who's looking after Moni? You're not my father. I, I don't want to be your you father. You can't treat me like this. You don't think everybody knows what's up, Haley? Everybody. She's about to cry. I can always tell when adults are about to cry. Why is my mom yelling? I'm just talking. They gotta figure something out. See, I took you on a safari. That was the trailer for Sean Baker's 2017 phantasmagorically fine moving picture, The Florida Project. Stay tuned for the live performance of John Steinbeck, scribe of social conscience, at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. It'll be the bee's knees. But next up is Country at War by John Doe and Exine Cervenka, performed by their band X. <laughs>
positively darb. That was Country at War by John Doe and Exine Cervenka, performed by their Sako band, X. We're now just minutes away from our live performance of John Steinbeck, Scribe of Social Conscience. The show's a real suck and it's right around the corner at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. But first, our final pre-show protest song, Daughters by Lissy. Gal knows her onions, eh? Thank you for choosing to tune into Radio Steinbeck. You were really on the trolley there, sport. And now, tonight's live performance of John Steinbeck, scribe of social conscience. Good evening. My name's Pat Kelly. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. Like you and all of the folks around the country. Um, we've all been deeply impacted by the violence, the inequities, 
and the dual crisis of the pandemic and um, the unrest in the streets and, and, and in particular violence against African Americans. And so tonight we're looking to one of the great voices of the United States, John Steinbeck, and in particular, um, this performance of John Steinbeck, Scribe of Social Conscience. And what I think the performance does is it looks at how we can look at Steinbeck's work and the American dream that has been held hostage and, and that's been revealed uh, more so in the last couple days. We're um, quite grateful to Megan Course, Paul McComas, and Daryl Allen Reed for sharing their both musical and performing talents with us. And I also want to extend a deep gratitude to the Center for Peacemaking, Safe and Sound, and the Alma Center. These are three organizations in Milwaukee um, that both are trying to respond to the pandemic while also transforming the deep racial divisions that grip our society. And we're doing this in a spirit of collaboration, honesty, and truth. And so without further ado, I'm happy to present John Steinbeck's Scribe of Social Conscience. Good evening. Welcome to John Steinbeck, Scribe of Social Conscience with Megan Kors. And Paul McComas. And Daryl Allen Reed. John Ernst Steinbeck, Jr., born in 1902, died in 1968. He was born and raised in Salinas, California. His father was the Monterey County Treasurer, his mother a school teacher who passed along to young John her love of reading and writing. John attended Stanford University for five years, but left in 1925 without a degree. He threw himself into his writing with the financial support of his father. Something to think about, you parents of creatives. Sometimes it works out to let your kid follow their dreams. While honing his craft, young John also worked off and on at ranches, stables, fish hatcheries, and canning plants. His first novel, Cup of Gold, was published in 1927 when Steinbeck was just 25. Over the next three and a half decades, 30 more books would follow, nearly a book a year. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1940 for 39's The Grapes of Wrath, and he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1962, the year in which his Travels with Charlie in Search of America was published. When Steinbeck accepted the Nobel, he cited Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner as the two colleagues whose work he most admired. It makes sense. They were really the big three in American literature during that middle one-third of the 20th century, that core of the century, roughly speaking from the Great Depression on one end to the civil rights era of the mid-60s on the other. Arguably, Hemingway and Faulkner were chiefly prose stylists. Uh, Hemingway, concise, economical, bare bones, minimalistic prose, and Faulkner, the other direction, florid, ambitious, experimental, and frankly, quite showy at times. While Steinbeck's usually unshowy style was chameleonic, adjusting to accommodate his material. He put the content first. He didn't want to distract from it because he was less concerned with style than what I call the three C's, characterization, content, and chronicling. My own motto as a fiction writer is, Reader-friendly fiction, smart with heart. That could apply to Steinbeck as well. In fact, better than it applies to my work. Steinbeck was the foremost chronicler of his times. And in that chronicling, he was a consistent and unflagging advocate for the less fortunate. That's why I'm drawn to his work ahead of Hemingway's and Faulkner's. Also why his work remains as relevant today as when he wrote it and probably always will be just that relevant. Now we're going to start with his first great work, arguably the great American short novel of Mice and Men, published in 1937. The title comes from a line from the Scottish poet Robert Burns, his 1785 poem to a mouse on turning her up in her nest with the plow. I'll give you the line from which the title comes. First in the original Scottish, in uh, honor of the McComas clan, 
and then in English. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glee and leave us not but grief and pain for promised joy. Uh, the best laid schemes of mice and men often go awry and leave us nothing but grief and pain instead of the promised joy, the joy we've been promised. Set on a California ranch of mice and men is a depression era story of loneliness and friendship, of persecution and self-sacrifice, and uh, it is a story of dreams and harsh realities. Mostly, I think it is a story about loneliness and the attempt to fill the void. Loneliness for multiple characters at the same time. Candy, the only old person, the declining man, and disabled to boot, missing one hand, working on a ranch otherwise staffed by young, strong, vital people. Curly's wife, the only woman on a ranch of men, married to the ranch owner's son. She's not even given a name in the book. That's not a slap at Steinbeck. He was far from a sexist. I think he was a proto-feminist. But he knew it would be appropriate because she has no agency, no identity, no life of her own. And Crooks, the ranch's only African-American worker, from whom we will be hearing in person short shortly. The nearest town is Soledad, Spanish for solitude, and it houses a penitentiary. Well, each of these characters is imprisoned by solitude, imprisoned by loneliness. Perhaps the other Paul MCC, Paul McCartney, was channeling Steinbeck when he wrote, all the lonely people, where do they all belong? In sharp contrast to these lonely characters is a remarkable friendship. Lenny, mentally retarded, sweet, a well-meaning giant of a man whose great strength sometimes gets him into trouble. He's utterly trusting of his friend, George, who is kind and savvy and dedicated to caretaking his childlike friend. We're going to perform the book's final scene, which I'll now set up. The night before they arrive at the ranch where they hope to work, they camp and cook out in the woods, and George gives Le Lenny an order. If Lenny gets into serious trouble, he's to leave the ranch, flee to the woods, and return to this very campfire spot, and George will meet him here. After they've been working at the ranch for one week, serious trouble does, in fact, occur. Lenny accidentally kills Curly's wife. He finds his way back to the campsite, George close behind. At George's heels is a mob of ranch hands led by Curly, intent on tracking Lenny down and lynching him. Suddenly, Lenny appeared out of the brush as silently as a creeping bear moves and came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. When a little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, Lenny's head jerked up and he strained toward the sound with eyes and ears until he saw the bird and then he dropped his head and drank again. When he was finished, he sat down on the bank with his side to the pool so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on top of them. The light climbed out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountain seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I, I didn't forget. You bet. Hide in the brush and wait for George. Oh, but George, you're going to... He gonna give me hell? George gonna wish it he was alone and not have me bothering him. I could go right off in them hills, so, and find a cave. Yeah, I won't never have no ketchup no more, but, but I won't care. If George don't want me, I'll go away. I'll, I'll go away. George came quietly out of the brush and said, what the hell you moaning about, Lenny? Oh, George. George, I, I, I thought you was, you was going to leave me. You ain't going to leave me, are you, George? No, I'm not. Oh, I knowed it, because you ain't that kind. Uh, George? Yeah. I done another uh, bad thing. It don't make no difference. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another, the approaching mob. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. George? Yeah? Ain't you gonna give me hell? Give you hell? Uh, sure, like you, 
like you always done before. Like it, if I didn't have you, I'd just take my 50 bucks. Jesus and- Christ, Lenny, you can't remember nothing that happens, but you remember every word I say. What, 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 ain't you gonna say it? If I was alone, I could live so easy. I could get a job and not have no mess. Yeah, go on. And, and when the end of the month come... And when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a cat house or... Go on, Georgia. Ain't she gonna give me no more hell? No. Well, I could go away. Yeah, I, I go right off in them hills and, and find a cave if, if you don't want me. No, I, I want you to stay with me, here. Well, then, you, tell me like you done before. Tell you what? About them other guys and, and about us. Guys like us got no family. They make a little stake and then they blow it. They ain't got nobody in the world that gives a hoot in hell about them. Yeah, but not us. Now, tell about us now, George. But not us. Because? Because... I got you. And, and, and I got you. Yeah, we got each other, that's what. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing and the leaves rustled and the wind waves flowed up the green pool and the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. Take, take off your hat, Lenny. The, the air feels fine. Okay. Lenny dutifully laid his hat on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer now, and the evening came on fast. On the wind, the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. George, tell how it's gonna be. Look across the river, Lenny, and I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Okay. We're going to get a little place. George reached into his side pocket and brought out the Luger. He snapped off the safety, and the hand and the gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head, at the place where the spine and skull were joined. A man's voice called from up the river, and another man answered. Go on. How's it going to be, George? Go on. We're going to get a little place, and... Uh, we'll have a cow, and, and we'll have maybe a pig and, and chickens, and down the flat we'll have a little, a little piece of alfalfa. <laughs> For the rabbits, huh? For the rabbits. <laughs> and I get to tend them rabbits, huh? And you get to tend them rabbits. <laughs> and we'll live off the fat of the land. <sighs> yeah. Yes. <sighs> George. No, no, Lenny, look down there, across the river, like you can almost see the place. There was crashing footsteps in the brush now. Go on, George. When we gonna do it? Gonna do it soon. Uh, real soon. Me and you, right? Right. You and me. Everybody gonna be nice to you. Ain't, ain't gonna be no more trouble. Nobody gonna hurt Nobody. I thought you was mad at me, George. No. No, Lenny, I ain't mad. I ain't never been mad at you, and and I ain't now. That's a thing I want you to know. Well, let's do it now then, George. let's, Let's get that place now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Sure, right now. I gotta. We gotta. And George raised the gun and steadied it, and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. I can see it, George. I I can see it. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. Lenny jarred and then settled slowly forward to the sand, and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him back up to the bank near the pile of ashes from their old campfire. The brush filled with cries and with the sound of running feet. A voice shouted. Say, George, is that you? Where you at, George? And then the group burst into the clearing. 
but George just sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his empty right hand that had thrown the gun away. It's one of the most powerful and poignant scenes and endings in American literature, and, and painful too. Painful for the reader or listener, as it should be, because it's painful for George, the point of view character, who in a terrible irony here is goaded by his, his friend, his, his brother, Lenny, into telling him how easy life would be without Lenny, moments before they are to be separated forever. Of course, with his awful, necessary act of mercy, George now joins the ranks of the lonely. He is free, free of his responsibilities toward Lenny, free to spend his time and his money on himself, his own wants and needs. But it is a freedom that leaves him paralyzed and hollow, just as, to use Steinbeck's words, stiff and empty as the hand that had thrown the gun away. It's a freedom that leaves him lost and alone. Steinbeck is saying, yes, we are our brother's keeper. We are, must be, our sister's keeper. We must because that is what gives life its meaning. Would that four Minneapolis policemen 11 days ago had been keepers and caretakers of their brother rather than accessories and murderers of him. We all know the name George Floyd and we all know what happened to him, a sidewalk lynching plain and simple, conducted by the police. But do we know Mr. Floyd himself? I didn't. You didn't. Let's get to know him from those who did. From Donnell Cooper, a former classmate. George was outspoken against gun violence, and he used to say, this young generation is lost. He had a quiet personality and a gentle spirit. From George's sister, Bridget, that man would give you the shirt off his back. From Courtney Ross, George's girlfriend. George came here to Minneapolis from Houston, and he stayed for the people and the opportunities. He loved the city. This is nothing but an angel that was sent to us on earth, and we demonized him, and we killed him. From Jesse Zendejas, a patron at the bistro where George worked as a security guard. Oh, George loved his hugs from his regulars. He would be disappointed if you didn't stop to greet him because he honestly loved seeing everyone and watching everyone have fun. From Roxy Washington, the mother of George's six-year-old daughter, he will never see Gianna grow up. He will never see her graduate. He will never walk her down the aisle. And she won't have him either. When there's a problem she's having as she grows up, her dad won't be there anymore to help her through, unquote. Finally, from George's lifelong friend, Oscar Smallwood. I never got that chance to say, I love you. Our gentle giant has gained his wings. George Floyd's own words, his last words were, I can't breathe. These were also Eric Garner's last words back in 2014 as he was being choked to death by police. And of course, Eric Garner and George Floyd are but two of many who couldn't breathe, whose breath was taken from them forever. Until and unless our nation wakes up, faces up to its sinful past and present, and actually does something to atone, till that day, I can't breathe. Megan can't breathe. You and you and you can't breathe. And neither can America. That day of atonement must be Today, Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter. Matter. John Steinbeck would have written more eloquently than I can about Mr. Floyd. In fact, he kind of did. I'm blessed tonight to be performing with two of the best actors and people I know, Megan Course and Daryl Allen Reed. From his Los Angeles home, Daryl now will enact a monologue entitled Crooks, eight minutes, 46 seconds that I adapted from Of Mice and Men. I am delighted and honored now to introduce you to my dear brother, Daryl Allen Reed, playing Crooks in Of Mice and Men. Who's that? What you doing in here? 
You ain't got no right to be in here. This is my room. Ain't nobody got a right to be in here but me. I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse. You ain't wanted in here. You all play cards in the bunkhouse and I can't play. Why? Because I'm black. They say I stink. Well, you, all of you stink to me. Stable buck. That's what they call me. Buck. Like I'm an animal. Making me live in this room, in this barn. Like an animal. Alone. Since you ain't getting out and leaving me alone, you might as well come in and have a seat. Come on. Have a seat on that keg right there. I, uh, I ain't no southern anymore. I was born right here in California. My old man had a chicken ranch. Really two eggs. White kids would come and play with us. Sometimes I'd go play with them. Some of them was pretty nice. My old man didn't like that. I never knew till long later why. But I know now. There wasn't another colored family for miles around. And now there ain't another black man on this ranch. And it's just the one colored family in all of Solidarity. So if I say something, why? Well, it's just a nigger saying it. I guess I don't mind you being here. Just a guy talking to another guy don't really make no difference who. Because the thing is, they talk. Or they sit still, not talking. That's fine too. It don't make no difference. No difference. It's just being with someone. That's all. <laughs> Old Candy, he says to me, You got a nice, cozy little place here, Crooks. Must be nice to have a room all to yourself. Sure, I tell him. And a manure pile at the windows. Sure. It's swell. Now just suppose you didn't have no body. Suppose you couldn't go into the bunkhouse and play running because you was black. How would you like that? Suppose you had to sit out here and read books. I'm sure you could play horseshoes with them. That is, till it got dark, then you got to go off by yourself and read books. Books ain't good. A guy needs somebody to be near him. A guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. Don't make no difference who it is, as long as he's with you. I tell you, a guy gets too long and he gets sick. Reading, reading, sometimes just thinking. And he got nobody to tell him what's so and what ain't so. Now maybe if he sees something, he don't know whether it's right or not. Can't turn to some other guy and ask him if he sees it too. He can't tell. He got nothing to measure by. I see things out here, and I wasn't drunk. I don't know if I was asleep. Now, if someone was with me, he could tell me I was asleep, and then it would be all right. But I just don't know. Of course, the uh, biggest, worst things <laughs> than being alone, white folks getting all up in my face. Listen, nigga. You know what I can do to you? You keep your place, nigga, and shut your trap. I could get you strung up on a tree so goddamn easy, it ain't even funny. <laughs> no. No, it ain't. I sure as hell ain't laughing. Seems like hundreds of years now since I was a kid growing up on my daddy's chicken. I had two brothers, one older, one young. It was always near me, always there. We used to sleep in the same room, in the same bed, all three. Had us a strawberry patch and a falcon patch. Now, we used to turn the chickens out in the morning on the uh, falcon on Sunday mornings. Me and my brothers just sit on the fence rail and watch. 
white chickens they was. Good chickens, good lamb. You know, I hear you all talking about getting some lamb, a little piece of land of your own. You guys are just kidding yourself. Talk about it a hell of a lot, but you won't get no land. You'll be a swamp of a higher here till they take you out in a box. Jesus, I've seen hundreds of men come by on the road and on the ranches with their dinners on their backs and, 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 and the same damn thing in their head. Hundreds of them. They come here, then they quit, and then they move on. <laughs> Every damn one of them's got a little piece of land in his head, and never a damn one of them gets it. Just like heaven. <laughs> Everybody wants a piece of land. Yeah, I read plenty of books out of here. Nobody ever gets to heaven, and nobody gets no land. They blow it on blackjack. They blow it in the whorehouses. And that's where the money goes, and it sure as hell ain't coming back. It's gone for good. See too many guys with land in their head, but they never get no land under their head. Nope. Never seen a guy really up and do it. But um, if you guys now, <laughs> if you guys to pull it off somehow, and if you would want someone to work for nothing, just to keep hoeing and odd jobs, well, I, I kind of lend a hand. <laughs> I ain't so crippled, I can't still work like a son of a bitch. <laughs> You uh, you are ain't gonna get no land, and even if you do, you you ain't gonna. You know, maybe you better go. Yeah, actually, I want you here no more. This here is my room. Nobody got any right to be here but me. If I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse, then you ain't wanted me. Colored man got to have some rights, even if you don't like them. And I got the right to be alone. Oh, what I said about Poland doing our jobs? Well, forget it. I didn't mean it. Just fool me. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go to no place like that. No, so, uh, just, uh, I would rather be. I could stand here and analyze that knockout performance we've just witnessed from Daryl Allen Reed. I could talk about how well Daryl conveys, among other things, Crooks's fear that he is losing his mind from loneliness, that the segregation to which he is subject is literally driving him crazy, and so forth. But in this case, let's allow Crooks and Daryl and Steinbeck to speak for themselves. Suffice it to say only that without any manipulation on our end or conscious intent on Daryl's, that video timed out at, yes, exactly eight minutes and 46 seconds, the length of time during which George, George Floyd lay helpless with the policeman's knee pressed into his throat, the length of time it took for George to be lynched. Caretaking people, rather than cutting them down, being our brothers and our sisters keepers. This turns up over and over throughout Steinbeck's entire canon, perhaps nowhere more clearly than in what would be his next work after Of Mice and Men, and what is our next work now as well. The Grapes of Wrath, published 1939 and won the Pulitzer a year later. This Depression era novel follows the Joad family, who are evicted from their farm in the Oklahoma Dust Bowl following a bank foreclosure. 
They head west for California, lured by the false promises of flyers that had been disseminated to draw more workers than necessary and thus drive down wages. En route and after their arrival in the so-called Golden State, the Jodes are beset with trials, the deaths of elderly family members, a lack of prospects for work, confrontations between strike leaders and strike breakers, insult and intimidation by the police, the possibility of imprisonment, and the constant looming threat of illness and starvation. It's appropriate that Steinbeck names the family Jode, which is so close to the biblical Job, for the trials of Job and his wife have nothing on those of Ma and Pa Jode, their children, and their friends. Given his own commitment to social justice in his life and work, Bruce Springsteen could fairly be described as Steinbeck with a guitar. Before Megan and I share with you the final scene from The Grapes of Wrath, we're going to perform Bruce's song, The Ghost of Tom Jode. Tom does not appear in the scene that we're going to perform. By that time in the book, pursued by authorities, he has had to leave his parents and go off on his own. But you will hear Tom's words to his mother in the final verse of the song, the verse at the end that we share. And I might mention as I'm putting this on that uh, you can comment and ask questions via the, what's it called? The uh, Q&A window. Q&A window. In Zoom. In Zoom. Yes. Uh, and I think there's chat, uh, but we like the Q&A window apparently. That's our preferred uh, method of, of collecting your questions and comments. And by the way, uh, the panel at the end is going to be something else. It's going to be a representative from each of our three partner organizations for this event. The Alma Center, Safe and Sound, and Marquette Center for Peacemaking. Megan and me, and yes, Daryl Allen Reed. The Ghost of Tom Joe.
In the novel's final act, the Joad family is living inside an abandoned boxcar when massive flooding forces them to take refuge on the boxcar roof. Here, Ma and Pa, Joad's daughter, Rose of Sharon, delivers a stillborn baby. With no way to bury it, they send the tiny body in a box down the creek, leading to this final scene as the merciless rain continues to pour down. The family huddled atop the boxcar, silent and fretful. The children and the men slept soddenly, side by side, and Ma lay close to Rose of Sharon. Sometimes Ma whispered to her and sometimes sat up quietly, her face brooding. Under the blanket, she hoarded the remains of the bread. The rain had become intermittent, little wet squalls and then quiet times. In the morning, Rose of Sharon whispered to Ma, and Ma put her hand under the blanket and felt Rose's breast. Ma nodded her head. Yes, she said. It's time for it. Come on, men. We're getting out of here, getting to higher ground, and you're coming or you ain't coming, but I'm taking Rosa Sharn and the little fellas out of here. Pa slipped down into the water and stood waiting. Ma helped Rose of Sharon down to the platform and steadied her across the car. Pa took Rose in his arms, held her as high as he could, and pushed his way carefully through the deep water around the car to the highway embankment. He set her down on her feet and held on to her. Uncle John carried little Ruthie and followed. Then Ma slid down into the water, and for a moment her skirts billowed out around her. Winfield, sit on my shoulder. Now, keep your feet still, boy. Ma staggered off through the breast high water. At the highway embankment, Pa helped her up and lifted Winfield from her shoulder. They stood on the highway and looked back over the sheet of water, the dark red blocks of the train cars, the trucks and motor cars sunk deep in the slowly moving water, and as they stood, a little misting rain again began to fall. We got to get along. Rosa Sharn, you feel like you could walk? Kind of dizzy, the girl said. Feel like I've been beat. Pa complained. Now that we're a-going, Ma, where are we going? I don't know. Come on, give your hand to Rosa Sharn. Ma took the girl's right arm to steady her and Pa her left. Go in some place where it's dry. Got to. You fellas ain't had dry clothes on for two days. They moved slowly along the highway. They could hear the rushing of the water in the stream beside the road. Ruthie and Winfield marched together, splashing their feet against the road. They went slowly. The sky grew darker and the rain thickened. No traffic moved along the highway. We got to hurry. If this here girl gets good and wet, I don't know what'll happen to her. Pa reminded Ma, you ain't said where we're a hurrying to. The road curved along beside the stream, and Ma searched the land and the flooded fields. Far off the road on the left, on a slight rolling hill, a rain-blackened barn stood. Look, Ma said, look there. I, I bet it's dry in that barn. Let's go there till the rain stops. Pa sighed, oh, we'll probably get run out by the fellow who owns it. From the right of the road, there came a sharp swishing. Hurry up. That's a big rain. Let's go through the fence here. It's shorter. Come on now. Bear on, Rosa Sharn. They half dragged the girl across the ditch and helped her through the fence, and then the storm struck them. Sheets of rain fell on them. They plowed through the mud and up the little incline. The black barn was nearly obscured by the rain, which hissed and splashed as the growing wind drove it along. Rose of Sharon's feet slipped, and she dragged between her two supporters. Ma turned to her husband. Pa, can you carry her? Pa leaned over and picked Rose up. We're all wet through. Hurry up now, Winfield. Ruthie, run on ahead, hon. They came panting up to the rain-soaked barn and staggered into the open end. There was no door. A few rusty farm tools lay about, a disc plow and a broken cultivator, an iron wheel. The rain hammered on the roof and curtained the entrance. Pa gently set Rose of Sharon down on an oily box. 
God almighty, he said. Look, there's some hay inside, Ma said. Come on, everybody. It was dark in the barn. A little light came through the cracks between the boards. Lay down, Rosa Sharn. Lay down and rest. I- I'll try to figure some way to dry you off. Winfield said, Ma! And the rain roaring on the roof drowned out his voice. Ma! What is it? What you want? Uh, look, look, Ma, in the corner. Ma looked. There were two figures in the gloom, a man who lay on his back and a boy sitting beside him. His eyes were wide, staring at the newcomers. As she looked, the boy got slowly up to his feet and came toward her. His voice croaked. You own this hair? No. Just come in out of the wet. We got a sick girl. You got a dry blanket we could use and get her wet clothes off? The boy went back to the corner and brought out a dirty comforter, and he held it out to Ma. Thank you. Well, what's the matter with, with that fella? But first he was sick, but now he's starving. He got sick in the cotton. He ain't at for six days. Ma walked to the corner and looked down at the man. He was about 50, his whiskery face gaunt, his open eyes vague and staring. The boy stood beside her. Your pa? Yeah. Uh, he said he wasn't hungry or that he just ate. He gave me all the food, but now he's too weak. He, he can't hardly move. The pounding of the rain decreased to a soothing swish on the roof. The gaunt man moved his lips. Ma knelt beside him, put her ear close. His lips moved again. Sure. J- just be easy, mister. You'll, you'll be all right. You just wait till I get them wet clothes off my girl. Ma went back to the girl. Now slip them off. Ma held the comforter up to screen Rose from view, and when Rose was naked, Ma folded the comforter about her. And the boy was at her side again then, explaining, I, I didn't know. He said he ate. Or, or he wasn't hungry, and last night I, last night I went and busted a window and, and, and stole some bread. I, I made him chew her down, but he picked it all up, and then he's weaker still. He got to have some soup or milk. You, you folks got money to get milk? Hush, don't worry, we'll figure something out. <laughs> yeah, but he's dying, I tell you. He's starving to death. Hush now. She looked at Pa and Uncle John standing helplessly gazing at the sick man. She looked at Rose of Sharon huddled in the comforter. Ma's eyes passed Rose of Sharon's eyes and then came back to them. And the two women looked deep into each other. The girl's breath came short and gasping as she said, Yes. Ma smiled. I knowed you would. I knowed. She looked down at her hands tight locked in her lap. Rose of Sharon whispered, Will, will you all please go out? The rain whisked lightly on the roof. Ma leaned forward and with her palm she brushed the tousled hair back from her daughter's forehead and she kissed her there. Ma got up quickly. All right, come on you fellas, you come out to the tool shed. Ruthie opened her mouth to speak. Hush, Ruthie, hush and get and she herded them all out. For a moment, Rose of Sharon sat still in the whispering barn. Then she hoisted her tired body up and drew the comforter about her. She moved slowly to the corner and stood looking down at the man's wasted face and into the wide, frightened eyes. Then slowly she lay down beside him. He shook his head from side to side, but Rose of Sharon loosened one side of the blanket and bared her breast. You got to. She squirmed closer and pulled his head in close. There. There. Her hand moved behind his head and supported it. Her fingers moved gently in his hair. She looked up and across the barn, and her lips came together and smiled mysteriously. Where to begin? I think with Maud Jode. One of the strongest, most heroic female characters in American literature. I'll take out a couple modifiers and say it again, it'll be just as true. One of the strongest characters in literature of any gender and from any land. She embodies the drive to survive and to caretake others, not just her family, 
but whoever else in need she encounters along the way. She is a force of nature. That storm has nothing on Ma Jode, and she is the hand of the divine in this suffering world. I like the fact that Steinbeck provides an inventory of the agricultural tools lying unused, gathering dust. It brings to mind the farm that was foreclosed upon and that the Jodes lost back in Oklahoma. And it brings to mind also the non-farm here in California, the farm they had hoped to have, but don't and apparently won't. As for the title, well, grapes traditionally are a symbol of plenty and also of transformation and renewal through venting. Steinbeck ends chapter 25 with these words. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy, growing heavy for the vintage. The migrants in California feel a growing fury at their low standard of living. They long for the chance to earn a decent wage, provide for their children, and be treated like human beings. Through collective action, Steinbeck proposes the bitter grapes of the people's wrath will be transformed into sweet wine of justice and plenty. Collective action. It's not a political term. It couldn't be more personal. The boy offers the comforter because Rose of Sharon, a stranger, needs it. Rose of Sharon, in return, offers the milk of her breast to the boy's starving father. There's no quid pro quo. This is not negotiated. This is not some kind of commercial or corporate deal. It's simply people giving of each other to each other because of urgent need. Now, the Grapes of Wrath also is a, a phrase within the battle hymn of the Republic, uh, as we know. Yeah, I think it goes, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Some people don't know that the melody comes from the song John Brown's Body, an anti-slavery song written by a regiment of Massachusetts Union soldiers. And so that the roots of the song with the grapes of wrath in it um, are a, an anti-slavery song, I think, is, is, is very telling. Because the characters in this novel, the Jodes and, and uh, others suffering during the Depression, are themselves enslaved, enslaved by poverty and enslaved by some of the practices to which they are subject in this society. We get finally to Rose of Sharon's mysterious smile that ends the book. It's a compelling image. You sort of picture a Mona Lisa smile, but I think it's something different and more. There is obviously a, a, a very literal physical relief at releasing the milk from her swollen breast. But beyond that, that smile, I think, has to do with an awareness on Rose of Sharon's part that in the midst of death, including even of her baby, she is able to be a purveyor of life. This is probably the most empowered that Rose of Sharon Jode has ever felt in her life. Here in this strange nativity scene, in a kind of a manger setting, where the baby's not there, and so Rose herself must be the savior. And that empowerment Rose feels, it comes from helping someone in need. What would John Steinbeck have thought about the state of our non-union today? What would he have said about Wisconsin's Supreme Court, Wisconsin, whose three organizations are partnering with us to host this. What we, uh, would he have said about Trump America? Perhaps the following passage from his work gives us some idea. Steinbeck wrote the following words in 1957 for an essay in Esquire magazine in defense of the playwright Arthur Miller, who has been pilloried by Wisconsin's own Joe McCarthy and HUAC, the House Un-American Activities Committee. Steinbeck wrote, quote, a law that is immoral does not survive, and a government that condones or fosters immorality is truly in a clear and present danger. I feel profoundly that our country is better served by individual courage and morals than by the safe and public patriotism that is, as they say, the last refuge of scoundrels. Steinbeck goes on, my father was a great man, as any lucky man's father must be. He taught me rules I do not think are abrogated by our nervous and hysterical times. He taught me glory to God, honor to my family, loyalty to my friends, respect for the law, love of country, and instant and open revolt against tyranny. 
whether it comes from the bully in the schoolyard, the foreign dictator, or the local demagogue. And if this be treason, then gentlemen, make the most of it, unquote. Cannery Row is a semi-comedic 1945 novel in vignettes that chronicles a quirky blue-collar neighborhood in Monterey. The colorful and even oddball denizens of Cannery Row manage, despite their eccentricities, to coexist and even support one another, for the most part with good humor. The point of view character is Doc, a marine biologist and a bachelor, based on Steinbeck's longtime best friend, marine biologist Ed Ricketts. Doc, though himself a bit eccentric, is viewed by all around him as the most stable, regular guy in town, respected and confided in by his neighbors, whom we meet in turn through Doc. Megan and I will introduce you to one of the odder oddball neighbors, Henri the Painter, from Cannery Row. Henri the Painter was not French, and his name was not Henri. Also, he was not really a painter. Henri had so steeped himself in stories of the left bank in Paris that he lived there, although he had never been there. Feverishly, he followed in periodicals the Dadaist movements and schisms, the strangely feminine jealousies and religiousness, the obscurantisms of the forming and breaking schools. Regularly, he revolted against outworn techniques and materials. One season, he threw out perspective. Another year, he abandoned the color red even as the mother of purple. Finally, Henri the painter gave up paint entirely. It is not known whether Henri was a good painter or not, for he threw himself so violently into movements that he had no time left for painting of any kind. As a boat builder, however, he was superb. Henri was a wonderful craftsman. He had lived in a tent years ago when he started his boat, and until galley and cabin were complete enough to move into, but once he was housed and dry, he had taken his time on the boat. The boat was sculpted rather than built. It was 35 feet long and its lines were in a constant state of flux. For a while it had a clipper bow and a fan tail like a destroyer. Another time it looked vaguely like a caravel. Since Henri had no money, it sometimes took him months to find a plank or a piece of iron or a dozen brass screws, but that was the way he wanted it, for Henri never actually wanted to finish his boat. It sat among the pine trees on a lot Henri rented for $5 a year. This paid the taxes and satisfied the owner. The boat rested in a cradle on concrete foundations. A rope ladder hung over the side except when Henri was at home. Then he pulled up the rope ladder and only put it down when guests arrived. His little cabin had a wide padded seat that ran round three sides of the room. On this he slept and on this his guests sat. A table folded down when needed and a brass lamp hung from the ceiling. His galley was a marvel of compactness, but every item in it had been the result of months of thought and work. Henri was swarthy and morose. He wore a beret. Long after other people had abandoned them, he smoked a calabash pipe and his dark hair fell about his face. Henri had many friends whom he loosely classified as those who could feed him and those whom he had to feed. His boat had no name. Henri said he would name it when it was finished. Henri had been living in and building his boat for 10 years. During that time, he had been married twice and had promoted a number of semi-permanent liaisons, and all of these young women had left him for the same reason. The seven-foot cabin was too small for two people. They resented bumping their heads when they stood up, and they definitely felt the need for a toilet. Marine toilets obviously would not work in a shorebound boat, and Henri refused to compromise by installing a spurious landsman's toilet. So he and his friend of the moment had to stroll away among the pines, and one after another, his loves left him. Just after a girl called Alice left him, a very curious thing happened to Henri. Each time he was left alone, he mourned formally for a while, but actually he felt a sense of relief. He could stretch out in his little cabin. He could eat what he wanted. He was glad to be free of the endless female biologic functions for a while. It had become his custom each time he was deserted to buy a gallon of wine, stretch out on the comfortably hard bunk, and get drunk. Sometimes he cried a little all by himself, but he usually had a wonderful feeling of well-being from it. 
he would read Rambeau aloud with a very bad accent, marveling all the while at his fluid speech. It was during one of his ritualistic mornings for the lost Alice that the strange thing began to happen. It was night, and his lamp was burning, and he had just barely begun to get drunk when suddenly he knew he was no longer alone. He let his eye wander cautiously up and across the cabin, and there, on the other side, sat a devilish young man, a dark, handsome young man. His eyes gleamed with cleverness and spirit and energy, and his teeth flashed. There was something very dear and yet very terrible in his face. And beside him sat a golden-haired little boy, hardly more than a baby. The man looked down at the baby, and the baby looked back and laughed delightedly as though something wonderful were about to happen. The man looked over at Henri and smiled, then glanced back at the baby. From his upper left vest pocket, the man took an old-fashioned straight-edged razor. He opened it and indicated the child with a gesture of his head. He put a hand among the curls, and the baby laughed gleefully, and then the man tilted the chin and cut the baby's throat, and the baby went right on laughing. But Henri was howling with terror. It took him a long time to realize that neither the man nor the baby was still there, if, in fact, they had ever been there at all. Henri, when his shaking had subsided a little, rushed out of the cabin, leaped over the side of the boat, and hurried away down the hill through the pines to Cannery Row. Doc was in the basement working when Henri burst in. Doc went on working while Henri told him all about it, and when it was over, Doc looked closely at him to see how much actual fear and how much theater was there. And it was mostly fear. Is it a ghost, do you think? Uh, is it some reflection of something that has happened? Or, or is it some Freudian horror out of me? Or am I completely knocked? I, I, I saw it, Doc, I tell you. It happened right in front of me, as plainly as I see you now. I don't know. Well, well, will you come up with me and see if it comes back? No, if I saw it, it might be a ghost, and that would scare me badly, because I currently don't believe in ghosts. But what am I going to do? If I see it again, I'm sure I will die. You see, he doesn't look like a murderer. He looks nice, and the kid looks nice, and neither one of them give a damn, but, but he cut that baby's throat. I saw it. I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist or a witch hunter, and I'm not going to start now. A girl's voice called into the basement. Hi, Doc. Can I come in? Come along, said Doc. She was a rather pretty and a very alert girl. Doc introduced her to Henri. He's got a problem. He either has a ghost or a terrible conscience, and he doesn't know which. Tell her about it, Henri. Henri went over the story again. The girl's eyes sparkled. But that's horrible. I I've never in my life even caught the smell of a ghost. Well, let's go back up and see if he comes again. Doc watched them go, a little sourly. After all, she had been his date. The girl never did see a ghost, but she proved fond of Henri, and it was five full months before the cramped cabin and the lack of a toilet drove her out. It's an amusing vignette, but with a heart of darkness. I should do a little shout out to all my friends on the Twilight Zone Politics Facebook page. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, you could probably analyze that piece pretty well because... Uh, that scene is kind of straight out of the Twilight Zone playbook. And incidentally, there is a huge overlap between these two heroes of mine, Steinbeck and Rod Serling, both exceptional writers of singular vision, deeply committed to social justice, to inclusion, and to the little guy and gal. Henri is a mass of affectations and artifice. He is a stunted adolescent, unable and or unwilling to finish his boat, to grow up, set sail, move forward. Then he has an epiphany. He's given this vision of the family and the future that he is blithely killing, but he forfeits the opportunity that his vision has provided, and he retreats back into his familiar affected pattern. Thus, the final line, though funny, is something else too. It was five full months before the cramped cabin and the lack of a toilet drove her out. It's a punchline that carries with it a dark tint of that unheeded warning and of that dark and unforgettable vision. Henri is stuck in a rut. He is stuck in himself. And for Steinbeck, turning inward is never the answer. Accordingly, the next song by my friend John Doe of my all-time favorite band, X, 
models in a kind of rollicking, fun-loving fashion, solidarity with otherwise homeless people and quirky people and so-called tramps who have found a home in Cannery Row. Or have they? Hey, it's awake. My bass is awake All this right. time. <laughs> Thank you, bass. Oh, John Doe signed this bass, actually, didn't he? Yes. He instructed me to roll and rock. So shall we? Let's do it. Okay. Oh, I need a harmonica. Hey, this hey. One. Delta 88 Nightmare. I want a two. I want two, three, four. I'm gonna go to Canary Row. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, gonna go, go to Canary, Canary Row. Row. We're gonna flop at no motel. We're gonna get as drunk as hell. We're gonna go find Mac and Doc. Cranky Dora, that whole flock. We're gonna go to Cannery Row. I said, we're gonna go to Cannery Row. Then I'll Delta 88, Delta 88, Delta 88, Delta 88 Nightmare. Then I'll Delta 88, Delta 88, Nightmare. I'm gonna go to Cannery Row. How about you? I'm gonna go to Cannery Row. All right, it's Cannery Row. But the poor folks are gone, I said. Doc ain't here. Different, son. It's a cute resort now with dads and moms. Stepping and tossing and making fun. There's nothing to do on Cannery Row, and there's nowhere to go on that Cannery Row. And a Delta 88, Delta 88, nightmare. Delta 88, Delta 88, nightmare. It's just a cute resort with dads and moms saying, I told you, Doc, and here's things are different, son. But down the alley, that's a doorway sign. Dancing pages that they can't find. The book's still true. Hey, look, Steinbeck, our pals are back. Hooray! In a Delta 88, Delta 88, nightmare. In a Delta 88, Delta 88, nightmare. One more time. In a Delta 88, It's a song about gentrification and displacement. Those words aren't in there, but that's clearly what it's about. It was written by John Doe in 1978, and there was a time when those words weren't on a lot of people's lips. They are now, fortunately. And that's the first step, I think, in doing something about it. Gentrification, displacement, and at the end, blessed return. East of Eden. Okay. A multi-generational family saga completed by Steinbeck in 1952. The title comes from Genesis chapter 4. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Unquote. The novel's characters, like the first biblical family, have been expelled from moral paradise and are forced to contend with the world of human evil and sin. What's more, Cain's famous retort to God after killing Abel, Am I my brother's keeper? is reworded slightly in the novel and given to the character Cal. A fine movie was made of this novel, a movie that made James Dean a star. And long as the movie was, it focused exclusively on the latter part of the book. We're going to compensate for that here by sharing with you from East of Eden, Chapter 2. When a child first catches adults out, when it enters his grave little head that adults do not have divine intelligence, that their judgments are not always wise, their thinking true, their sentences just, the child's world drops into panic. The gods are fallen and all safety gone. And there is one sure thing about the fall of gods. They do not fall a little. They crash and shatter or sink deeply into green muck. It is a tedious job to build them back up. They never quite shine. And the child's world is never quite whole again. Young Adam found his father out. It was not that his father Cyrus changed, 
but that some new quality came to Adam. Now, he had always hated discipline, as every normal animal does, but it was just and true and as inevitable as measles, not to be denied or cursed, only to be hated. And then, and this was very fast, almost a click in the brain, then Adam knew that for him at least, his father's methods had no reference to anything in the world but his father. Cyrus's techniques and training were designed not for the boys, Adam and his younger half-brother Charles, but only to make Cyrus seem a great man. And that same click in the brain told Adam that, no, his father was not a great man, <laughs> that he was, in fact, merely a very strong-willed and concentrated little one-legged man wearing a huge Busby hat. Now, who knows what causes this? A look in the eye, a lie found out, a moment of hesitation. Then God comes crashing down in a child's brain. Young Adam was always an obedient child. Something in him shrank from violence, from contention, from the silent, shrieking tensions that can rip at a house. He contributed to the quiet he wished for by offering no violence, no contention, and to do this, he had to retire into secretness, since there is some violence in everyone. He covered his life with a veil vagueness, while behind his quiet eyes, a rich, full life went on. This did not protect him from assault, but it allowed him a partial immunity. His half-brother Charles, just over a year younger, grew up with their father's assertiveness. Charles was a natural athlete with instinctive timing and coordination and the competitor's will to win over others, which makes for success in this world. Young Charles won all contests with the older Adam, whether they involved skill or strength or quick intelligence, and he won them so easily that quite early on, Charles lost interest and had to find his competition among other even older children. Thus it came about that a kind of affection grew between the two boys, but it was more like an association between brother and sister than between brothers. Charles fought any boy who challenged or slurred Adam, and he usually won. He protected Adam from their father's harshness, with lies and even with blame-taking. Charles felt for his older brother as one feels for helpless things, for new babies and blind puppies. Adam looked out of his covered brain out of the long tunnels of his eyes at the people of his world. His father was a one-legged natural force at first installed to make little boys feel littler and stupid boys aware of their stupidity. And then, after God had crashed, Adam saw Cyrus as the policeman laid on by birth, the officer who might be circumvented or fooled, but never challenged. And Adam saw his half-brother Charles as a bright being of another species, gifted with muscle and bone, speed and alertness, quite on a different plane, to be admired as one admires the sleek, lazy danger of a leopard, not by any chance to be compared with oneself. And it would no more have occurred to Adam to confide in his brother, to tell him of the hunger, the gray dreams, the plans and silent pleasures that lay at the back of the tunneled eyes than it would to share his thoughts with a lovely tree or a pheasant in flight. Toward Alice Trask, his stepmother and Charles's mother, Adam concealed a feeling that was akin to a warm shame. She was not his mother, that Adam knew because he had been told many times. It was not from things said, but from the tone in which other things were said that Adam knew he had once had a mother and she had done some shameful thing. And as a result of her fault, she was not here. Adam thought sometimes that if he could only find out what sin it was she had committed, why, he would sin it too and not be here. Alice treated the boys equally, washed them and fed them and left everything else to their father, who had let it be known to her clearly and with finality that training the boys physically and mentally was his exclusive province. Even praise and reprimand he would not delegate. Alice never complained, quarreled, laughed, or cried. Her mouth was trained to a straight line that concealed nothing and offered nothing too. But... Once, when Adam was quite small, he wandered silently into the kitchen. Alice did not see him. She was darning socks, and she was smiling. Adam retired secretly and walked out of the house and into the woodlot to a sheltered place behind a stump. 
that he knew well. He settled deep between the protecting roots. Adam was as shocked as though he had come upon Alice naked. He breathed excitedly, high against his throat, for Alice had been naked. She had been smiling. Smiling? She... He wondered how she had dared such wantonness, and he ached toward her then with a longing that was passionate and hot. He did not know what it was about, but all the long lack of holding, of rocking, of caressing, the hunger for breast and nipple and the softness of a lap and the voice tone of love and compassion and the sweet feeling of anxiety, all these were in his passion, but he did not know it because he did not know such things existed, so how could he miss them? It occurred to him then that he might be wrong, that some misbegotten shadow had fallen across his face, warped his seeing, so he cast back to the sharp picture in his head. Oh, then he knew. Uh, those eyes, they were smiling too. Twisted light, it could do one or the other, distort the mouth or the eyes, but it, not both. He stalked her then. He spied on Alice, hidden and from unsuspected eye corner, and... It was true. Sometimes when she was alone and knew she was alone, she permitted her mind to play in a garden and she smiled. And, and it, it was, was wonderful. wonderful. Adam concealed his treasure deep in his tunnels, but he was inclined to pay for his pleasure with something. So Alice began to find gifts in her sewing basket, in her worn out purse, under her pillow, two cinnamon candies, a bluebird's tail feather, half a stick of green sealing wax, a stolen handkerchief. At first, Alice was startled, but then that passed, and when she found some unsuspected present, the garden smile flashed and disappeared, the way a trout crosses a knife of sunshine in a pool. She asked no questions and made no comments. But Alice was not well. Her coughing, was very bad at night, so loud and disturbing that Cyrus at last put her into another room, or he would have got no sleep. But he did visit her very often, hopping on his one bare foot, steadying himself with hand on wall. The boys could hear and feel the jar of his body throughout the house as he hopped to and from Alice's bed. Chapter two. Uh, fine writing. <laughs> I see why Steinbeck considered East of Eden to be his masterpiece. This is the most capital L literary style that I have ever seen him use. And there are elements of Faulkner in there, the effective use of uh, run-on sentences, which you know, I generally tell my writing students to, to steer clear of if they can. But if you're Faulkner or Steinbeck or Joyce Carol Oates, then you can do it. Uh, <laughs> so this. This section forecasts a great deal about the latter part of the, the novel, the part um, on which the movie is based, about how Adam will be when he grows up, how he will be as a parent of boys himself. And this section establishes a theme of legacy. Uh, what gets passed down through the generations? What gets passed down through the genes? Nature or nurture or the lack of nurture? Attitude and behavior? passed down through what people do and what they withhold, what they do for and to each other, or what they don't. You can see from these few pages in chapter two that Steinbeck is tackling big, timeless themes, both Oedipal and biblical, clearly from the title. There are parallels to the biblical stories of both Cain and Abel, obviously, but also Jacob and Esau. He introduces the characters one by one, which is very smart. You get a sense first of Adam, then of Cyrus, then of the half-brother Charles, and finally of Alice Trask, the stepmother. And he takes a different approach than I generally do, and than I generally tell my students to, to consider in terms of storytelling. Uh, he does a lot of summarizing and synopsizing here, whereas I tend to, to say, bring an individual moment to life and to light in vivid detail and then move on to the next and the next and the next to create shared history between the reader or listener and the characters. Uh, it's a good reminder about the subjectivity of all these things because this works brilliantly, what he has done, the summarizing and synopsizing that he, that he does here. Um, you know, the literature is subjective, the arts are subjective, life itself, perception is subjective. And when I start thinking about uh, a way to write as kind of doctrine, it has the risk of turning into dogma. So I actually look at this piece and I think that 
part of the effectiveness of that moment that he brings to life and to light toward the end, seeing Alice smile and then the repercussions of it, uh, part of the effectiveness comes from the fact that it is the first fully realized scene in this excerpt, in this chapter. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics in literature, uh, the, the early childhood event that sort of casts the die and uh, sets the stage for uh, the life to follow. For young Adam, life outside Eden, east of Eden, means a childhood without a mother's love, without what Joseph Campbell would call the meeting with the goddess, the meeting with the female power and the female mind, the female spirit. Uh, and, and without that, he is lost. Steinbeck is saying, really, that we are all outside Eden. We are all outside paradise, some of us, like Adam, farther outside than others. And so it is up to each of us to caretake and love one another out here east of Eden. From 1960 into 61, my birth year, at the age of 58, my current age, that's all kind of weird, Steinbeck drove nearly 10,000 miles with his black standard poodle Charlie in an improvised mobile home. The duo traveled around the periphery of the continental US, from the east coast where they lived at the time, up to the northeast, and then across the northern plains to the northwest, Pacific Northwest, down the western coast, his beloved California, to the southwest, down across the southwest to the deep south, and uh, then headed north and back home, circled counterclockwise, which is appropriate because by the time they reached the deep south, it was as if Steinbeck and Charlie had gone back in time, or at least had reached a region where time long had stood still. Please stick around for the talk back right after this, the finale of the show proper, taken from the Deep South section of Steinbeck's 1962 book, his road memoir, Travels with Charlie in Search of America. Now, this passage does include the N-word. We are not going to use it. It is a different situation than if Daryl chooses to use the word as it was written in Steinbeck. Megan and I don't feel comfortable using it um, from our place of white privilege. Charlie is a tall dog. As he sat in the seat beside me throughout our journey, his head with its mop of black curls was almost as high as mine. He'd put his nose close to my ear and say, he is the only dog I ever knew who could pronounce the consonant F. This is because his front teeth are crooked, a tragedy which keeps him out of dog shows. Because his upper front teeth slightly engage his lower lip, Charlie can pronounce F. The word Chat. usually means he would like to salute a bush or a tree. So I would open the cab door and let him out, and he'd go about his ceremony. You know, he doesn't have to think about it to do it well. It's my experience that in some areas, Charlie is more intelligent than I am, but in others, he is abysmally ignorant. He can't read, can't drive a car, can't do mathematics, has no grasp of math or science. But in his own field of endeavor, which he was now practicing, the slow, imperial, smelling over and anointing of an area, in this he has no peer. Of course, his horizons are limited. But then, how wide are mine? A bit wider now, I suppose, for having completed this trip. Journeys, I've learned, are things in themselves, each one an individual, and no two alike. People don't take trips. Trips take people. The lifespan of journeys seems to be variable and unpredictable. Who has not known a journey to be over and dead before the traveler returns? The reverse is also true. Many a trip continues long after movement in time and space have ceased. I remember a man in Salinas who in his middle years traveled to Honolulu and back, and that journey continued for the rest of his life. We would watch him in his rocking chair on his front porch, his eyes squinted, half closed endlessly journeying to Honolulu. My own journey started long before I left and was over before I returned. I know exactly where and when it was. It was in the deep south. One evening I gave a ride to a nice looking young man who was somewhere between 30 and 40. His hair was nearly ash blonde, worn long and clearly treasured since he whopped it with a pocket comb unconsciously and often. He wore a light gray suit that was travel wrinkled and stained. He carried the jacket over his shoulder. His white shirt was open at the collar. 
His speech was the deepest South I had heard so far. He asked where I was going, and when I told him I aimed toward Jackson and Montgomery, he begged a ride with me. When he saw Charlie, he said, At first I thought you had a colored in there with you. I let that go. Charlie jumped into the back, then my passenger settled himself comfortably, and I drove. Of course, I could tell right off you're from the north. Oh, you got a good ear. Well, I get around. Hmm. I think I was responsible for what happened next. If I could have kept my mouth shut, I might have learned something of value. But there's the restless night to blame, and the length of the journey, and the nervousness. Then, too, Christmas was coming, and I found myself thinking of getting home more often than a committed reporter should. We established that I was traveling the nation and that he was on the lookout for a job. So you come up the river. Oh. Did you see the doings in New Orleans? I knew he meant the disruption of school integration by the so-called cheerleaders. Yes, I did. Yeah, wasn't they something? Oh, it does your heart good to see somebody do their duty, huh? I think it was there that I went haywire. I should have grunted and let him read what he wanted in it, but a nasty little worm of anger began to stir in me. They doing it out of duty? Oh, sure. God bless them. Somebody got to keep the goddamn colors out of our school. It comes a time when a man's got to sit down and think, and that's the time you got to make up your mind to sell your life for something you believe in. Did you decide to do it? Oh, I sure did. Me and a lot more like me. And what do you believe in? Well, I'm not just about to allow my kids to go to school with no colors. And yeah, I'll sell my life for that, but I, I aim to kill me a whole, a whole goddamn flock of them before I go. Hmm? How <laughs> many children do you have? I don't have any, but I, I aim to have some, and I promise you that when I do... They won't go to school with no colors. Do you propose to sell your life before or after you go off and have all these children? You know, you sound to me like a color lover. I might have known it. Y'all troublemakers come down here from the north and tell us how to live. But you won't get away with it, mister. We got our eye on you. I just have this very brave picture of you selling your life. By God, I was right. You are a color lover. <laughs> No, I'm not, and I'm not a white lover either, if it includes those noble cheerladies of yours. Uh, you you want to hear what I think about you? No. I put on the brake and pulled off the road. Well, what you stopping for? Get out. You gonna make me? I reached into the space between my seat and my car door, where I keep absolutely nothing. Oh, okay, 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 okay. He got out and slammed the door so hard that Charlie wailed with annoyance. I started instantly, but I heard the young man scream in the mirror, and I saw his hating face, his open, spit-ringed mouth. Colored lover! Colored lover! He kept shouting as long as I could see him, and I don't know how long after. It's true, I'd goaded him, but I couldn't help it. I guess when they're drafting peacemakers, they'd better pass me by. I picked up another passenger between Jackson and Montgomery, a young Negro student with a sharp face and the look and feel of impatience. He carried three fountain pens in his breast pocket, and his inner pocket bulged with papers. I knew he was a student, because I asked him. He was alert. The northern sound of my speech relaxed him as much as he is ever likely to relax. We discussed the sit-ins. He had taken part in them and in the bus boycott. I told him what I had seen in New Orleans. He had been there, too. He had expected what I was shocked at. Finally, we spoke of Martin Luther King and his teaching of passive but unrelenting resistance. It's too slow, he said. It will take too long. Well, but there's improvement, right? Besides, I think Gandhi proved it's the only weapon that can win against violence. I know all that. I've studied it. But the gains are drops of water, and time is passing. I want it faster. I want action. Action now. Yeah, but couldn't that defeat the whole thing? I, I might be an old man before I'm a man at all. I, I might be dead before. Well, that's true. And, and Gandhi is dead because of violence. Well, tell me, are, th are there many like you who want action now? Yes. I mean, some. I mean, I, I don't know how many. I could tell he was getting nervous, so we talked of other things then. He was a passionate and eloquent young man with anxiety and fierceness just below the surface. But when I dropped him in Montgomery, 
He leaned through the window and he laughed. <laughs> I'm ashamed. It's, it's just selfishness. But I want to see it. Me. Not dead. Here. Me. I want to see it. Soon. And then he swung around and wiped one eye with his hand, and he walked quickly away. With all the polls and opinion posts, with newspapers more opinion than news, so that we no longer know one from the other, I want to be very clear about one thing. I have not intended to present, nor do I think I have presented any kind of cross-section, so that a reader can say Steinbeck thinks he has presented a true picture of the South. I don't think that. <laughs> I've only told what a few people said to me and what I saw. I don't know whether they were typical or whether any conclusion can be drawn. But I do know it is a troubled place and a people caught in a jam. And I know that the solution, when it arrives, will not be easy or simple. I feel that the end, equal rights and justice for all, that end is not in question. Rather, it's the means, the dreadful uncertainty of the means. Well, for John Steinbeck, the means of effecting positive, inclusive social change was literature. His vivid characterizations of those in dire need and his poignant, empathetic evocation of their struggles, these undoubtedly played and still play a far greater role than he ever knew. Steinbeck's work can only help in bringing about more fair and more just conditions in this nation that he both loved and endlessly challenged do, do better. better. Well, good evening, and I just want to thank Megan, Paul, and Daryl uh, for the performance tonight. It certainly was moving and gave us a lot to think about, as I said in the beginning. Um, tonight's event um, was co-hosted by Safe and Sound, the Alma Center, and the Marquette Center for Peacemaking, three groups that have a long track record of working for a more equitable and just society. And we're grateful um, to have both uh, Joe Marr and Terry, um, the leaders of the Alma Center and Safe and Sound here with us today. And so to start off our q and is I'm hoping that each of our panelists, you know, you, we're all a pretty diverse group, uh, performers, founder of a healing center, the executive of an organization focused on community safety and community organizing. Can you tell me a little bit about how you uh, came together for this event and, and a little bit about what your organization is doing? And maybe uh, we could jump in with you, Jomar. Well, good afternoon um, or good evening now. Um, my name is Jomar Hooper. I'm the executive director of Safe and Sound. Um, excited to, you know, have witnessed some great performances this afternoon and this evening and, you know, just some really, some real timely work, you know, to, to, to see it um, having taken place so many years ago and the, the being, being written so many years ago, but still have a lot of relevance to what we are going through, what we're seeing today is, is a testament to the strength of the author and, um, and I really appreciate being able to be a part of this today. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm the executive director of Safe and Sound. We're an organization in Milwaukee that works across sectors um, to build safe communities um, through community organizing, youth organizing, and partnerships with law enforcement and other community partnerships. Um, well, just a little bit about me personally, I was born and raised, excuse me, I was raised in Milwaukee, and um, I've been one of the biggest cheerleaders for Milwaukee for the longest. You know, I've spent a lot of my career um, in public policy, and now to be able to lead an organization that's working directly to try to create safe opportunities for residents in multiple neighborhoods is, is such a such a blessing and such a great opportunity. So, um, as you can imagine, it's been a rough week last week, and, you know, um, just trying to figure out how we as an organization can can cope and get through and, you know, protect the safety of our staff. Uh, and also um, just how do we ensure that our residents are safe and that they have a space and opportunity to have their, um, uh, the desire for change heard. Thanks, Jamaria. That's uh, great to hear. And, and certainly, um, yeah, the impact that you've made on Milwaukee has been profound even before Safe and Sound, and we're excited to see 
in a minute, I want to get a little to some of the things you uh, hinted at about how folks are responding to the current situation. But maybe uh, we could hear from some of our performers. Uh, Daryl, do you want to jump in a little bit about how you came to this collaboration? Hey, Daryl. Hey, Daryl, can you hear us? There he is. Yes. Hey, everybody. Hey, Daryl. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, job well done, guys. Can I just say what a challenge it was to try and bring yourself to perform in this during this week and in our current uh, atmosphere? I, I, you know, I, I love what I do, but this was especially challenging, and I'm just very, very um, happy to have been a part of it. Thank you all for welcoming me, and uh, I, I appreciate the effort. And I think it was monumental how you were able to integrate it in such a seamless fashion. And, and thank you again. Oh, our absolute pleasure, Daryl. You know, um, and for other people, I mean, I've known Daryl for a long time. We've worked together on different uh, performance projects. Um, but I don't think I reached out to you until, was it Tuesday? Uh, to ask if you want to. Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't have yeah. much time to please get off the book. Uh, block it, tape it, um, and then Keith Emerald and I um, work on it today on a technical level. Um, but, you know, Daryl and to everyone, when Megan and I started planning this a couple months ago when Peacemaking uh, approached me and said, hey, could you reprise well, the book, you know, book online because we're looking for I, I, I also yeah. the, the backdrop was the pandemic. And that's still the pandra the backdrop, but there's this other huge backdrop too now that you know was there before, but had not been laid bare before in the way that it was eleven days ago. So we kind of looked at each other uh, a week yes. ago and said, by Zoom. <laughs> "Right by Zoom," <laughs> and said, "I'm not sure this program is quite up to the moment right now." I mean, we do finally get around to race at the very end with Travels with Charlie, but shouldn't it be at the beginning and the end? And there was crooks just waiting for me in those pages. And, and I knew instantly who needed to play that role if he so desired. And I knew you'd kill it, man. And thank you. <laughs> and, and just the weirdness of you, you take this thing, you send it to us. Keith and I, we did a fade out, fade in. And when we'd done that, it was eight minutes and 46 seconds on the dot. Yeah. Well, and, and Paul and Daryl, we both, you both did a great job. But you and know I what that everyone. is, Paul? What is it, Daryl? What is it? That. It's what? Say again, please. I, I was going to say that, that that's God in action. Yeah. It's kind of a That pure is moment. God in action. Yeah. Yeah. It does seem to the, it's, the seem whole like uh, creative uh, aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like like Paul mentioned, we he was approached to reprise the Steinbeck show, and he had actually talked about the show to me. I don't know sometime in our four year collaboration about turning it into a two person um, performance, and it was just the perfect time. It was definitely a challenge to try and figure out how to do this in the current situation of not being able to do it in person with each other, except we are now, not wearing masks, but we're, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been collaborating for, for several years now, and um, I'm always happy to jump on whatever Paul has in mind, honestly. <laughs> like, God help you. <laughs> it's, always, um, it's always fascinating for me to learn. I mean, I read Of Mice and Men in high school, but I was not very familiar with much of his other work. I know of it, but I never had a chance to, to read it or let alone perform it. So I was very happy to be asked to be a part of this. Something tells me you might track some of it down now. I think so. <laughs> Carrie? Hi, Carrie. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for that really beautiful and powerful performance, Megan, Paul, and Daryl Allen Reed. What a great addition to bring in. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of the OM Center. And our mission is working with men involved in the criminal justice system. Um, we work on, on actually reconnecting men to the truth of who they are, 
understanding and exploring what happened to people, not what's wrong with them or what they did in our community, but really what happened that has people responding in a way that is um, passing on pain to other people and to other community in our lives. I mean, it, to other to other community and other people in their lives. Certainly this week has laid bare the truth of what happens to people. It's not just about what happens in people's individual lives, but it's about what's happened to people generationally, historically, and culturally in this country. And what happens in individuals' people's lives adds to that. So our work is really about supporting people, supporting men in a journey of healing and reconnecting back to the truth of who they are. Um, our, we primarily work with African-American men um, our staff is primarily African-American men, and I wish they were the people here, but they are actually probably out a few blocks away from me right now in the demonstration that's going on in our city. Um, it's interesting to me that we began, I mean, interesting is not the right word, right? It's, um, I don't know what the right word is, but when we put this together, we were really thinking about the pandemic and thinking how people needed to have a chance to just like get away from the isolation that was going on in home and actually just reconnect with creativity and reconnect with um, joy, all those things. I don't know about all the joy that's in there, <laughs> but it was, um, it was really powerful to think about how these, the, what resonated with me tonight was the themes of what happens to people, how it continues to um, to play out in their life and to overlay their lives and, and how the creative arts have really helped us, all of us have empathy and understanding and compassion for that. And what a great like soothe it is to soul right now to connect with creativity. Um, and it's not just a soothe to soul because that's not what we need. I mean, we need that, but we also need a call to action and both of those things were very powerful tonight. So it looks like we got two questions here. I wanna read the first one from an audience member and maybe each of our panelists could think about it for a minute and then I'll read the second one that I think we could answer first, which is really geared more for the community partners. So the question for everyone that if you could just take a moment to think about, um, it's what's the best way for folks to collectively act and bring about permanent change, especially in terms of when individually people should recognize when is it a time to listen and follow, and then also to discern when is it a time to speak up. And the individual who asked that really wanted to say thank you for uh, the performance tonight. And so while folks think about that, maybe Terry, we could uh, start with you with this other question and it um, deals with folks who are grappling with the racially motivated violence, the pandemic and equities facing our community, city and country. How exactly is your organization responding? And are there any specific strategies um, that you'd like to share with the group? So sort of two related questions. Maybe we'll start with you, Terry, go to Joe Mara and then come back to that other question. Um, I think one very, very important strategy right now is to follow the leadership of African-American people in our community. And there's been very, um, I think I'll try to post it to the chat box if I can, or maybe there's some way that we can get it out because there's been a platform of um, what our community and how our community needs to respond. And to me, that's the, that's the leadership that I'm following right now. Okay, where do we fit into that platform? What do we do internally? This is the work that we've been doing since our founding. Um, uh, but what, uh, like before, it seems like this needs to be the purpose of why we're here, in my opinion. Um, we have a whole history that we need to, um, that we need to understand, that we need to tell the truth about, and that we need to heal from. And that really needs to be our work. I think there are different paths that happen right now is that one of the things that we're doing internally is there the book me and white supremacy is a required workbook now for all of our um, white staff so that we can really un un continue to deepen our journey in with each other and hold um, hold each other accountable for the work that we're doing. We need to, our work for the men that come to our programming has been to hold space for them right now. That is our work. That is our job, is to give people the opportunity and the space to release 
And then it is also our job to become involved, to continue to engage in the movement for change. And that can be in whatever forum um, is the one that finds our voice. It might be in marching on the street. It might be in working in, in the, um, with the police, with the DA, wherever we have access. It's like, I mean, it's always been our job, but it's just like, that is what we're here to do. Like that we have to be, to me, we have to be the people that heal this. It's not a sustainable model going forward. And that's really clear. This whole combination of everything seems like the portal for us to step in to do that work at a deeper level. Yeah, lots of good points. And what about you, Jomar? What about safe and sound institutionally? What sort of responses are taking place? Yeah, I, I would uh, definitely echo a lot of the sentiments that Terry uh, just spoke on. Um, and particularly, I think, you know, I'm leaning heavily these days on the, um, on the, the phrase that silence is complicity. So I think it's important for organizations like Safe and Sound and leaders like myself to be able to lend our voice to this. You know, there's, I could be working behind the scenes trying to get things done, but I think at this point in time, it's, it's, it's our, our staff and our residents need us to be visible and need us to specifically call out what the injustices are in no uncertain terms, um, just so that we're all on the same page and that we all can move forward um, with a shared understanding of what is happening and what needs to be changed um, on an institutional level. Um, that's been one of the things that we've really been grappling with and trying to work towards this week. Um, and I know Terry mentioned, you know, staying, you know, staying in our lane has really been important for us as an organization as we move forward with this. There's some great, amazing young people out on the front lines doing their, doing their thing, leading this work right now, you know, and that's, um, in, in safe and sound, that's not our, that's not our, our call right now. You know, our call is to make sure our residents are safe. Um, we've been really providing a safe space for our residents to have a virtual environment where they can um, get together and talk about things that are going on within the community. Um, one particular thing I want to highlight is um, three times a week we have youth engagement virtual plugins where we have uh, youth and um, uh, members from the community have a safe space, um, just an hour where we can talk about whatever is going on with these youth. We can learn what's going on with them, what they're seeing, and plus we can learn from them um, as far as what, what they need, what they want, and how we can better support them um, as they're seeing these injustices in our community. And I also think too, um, as organizations that have power and, and, and connections, um, it's incumbent upon us to use those connections, whether that's you know, um, talking with the mayor's office, talking with our partners in MPD, par talking with other folks in, um, um, in, in other com community groups. Because I think we've moved, we've, we're past the point of you know, just playing around the edges now when it comes to getting things done. I think nothing less than deep systematic change in these institutions will be accepted at this point in time. So I think it's incumbent upon us and, and definitely at Safe and Sound, we, 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 we're, we're really ringing the bell, you know, just to, to see how we can get things done within this community on a deep systematic level, working with our partners and using uh, the space that we have been granted and staying in our lane at the same time. Yeah, well, I appreciate both comments. And one of the things I've admired about both organizations and I think as a society is on the one hand, you're helping people be strong and tenacious, but also it sounds like at the same time creating space for people to find a little comfort and support and healing and you know that's a, a dual role um and it leads really into the other question from one of the audience members um and maybe we can go to megan and paul to jump into this and it's a question that i know we're facing from a lot of the students is you know when do you listen and follow when do you speak up when do you act as an individual um, and when do you act as a collective? As artists, as well as uh, folks who've delved into Steinbeck, how would you respond? And I don't know, Megan, if you wanna jump in and then Paul. Yeah. And, then, and then you, Daryl, yeah, go ahead. I, uh, I think people need to, I think white people need to listen and that will give them an education into what they, have been doing and then educate themselves with resources that I'm seeing shared all over social media, Instagram and Facebook. People are just giving lists of like, this is what you need to read, white people. This is what you need to watch. Like we've been talking about this for decades and this is all the material you need to understand why this is all happening and the atrocities that just 
have changed over time, but they've never really gone away. Um, and I also agree that it's so important to, to take action. Um, silence does, does no good. And I have seen so many different people in my life. Um, I've lived in Wisconsin. I'm from Wisconsin. I'm, I went to college in Milwaukee. I graduated from UW-Milwaukee. Um, I also lived in northern Wisconsin, and north, that part of the country, that part of the state is like another world. Like, it's just yeah. baffling. Um, and uh, as someone that comes from uh, a, a background, my grandmother is uh, actually African American and Native American and white. So I grew up knowing all about this stuff, and I, I feel like a, like a, a covert person like operative like i undercover, undercover yeah. exactly like like listening to the way white people talk i'm like no like you cannot say that you don't understand like so this revolution that's happening right now is is so exciting and so like i just feel like people's hearts are opening up so widely and i just hope it continues and that people keep listening they need to keep listening to our African-American brothers and sisters and hear exactly what they've been trying to tell us for generations. I didn't know how I was going to answer until I heard Megan and it all came together. Because there's, there's listening, there's saying, and there's doing. And I think you're right, white people need to stop saying and do a combination of listening and doing listening to get the perspective and understanding that we don't have or don't have enough of, and then acting upon it, uh, you know, commensurate with what we're being told needs to happen. Um, I think Dr. King said, evil occurs when good people do nothing. Good people say nothing. Uh, that's enabling is what that is. And, and Mandela said uh, that uh, the, it's not just the oppressed, but equally the oppressor who needs to be liberated because the act of oppressing uh, is, is an oppression, is an imprisonment, is a confinement, is, um, is a destruction of the spirit. Um, and I, you know, the last thing I'd say on this, and I'm speaking just for myself here, because um, I can get pretty political at times, um, maybe uh, the indication that it's time to actually do, uh, to step forward as so many people are doing, is when the leadership at the top level alternates between atrocious and absent. It can't get any worse. I'm 58, I've seen some bad presidents and some good ones. A really good one, the best one of my life, very recently. I've never seen anything, this is not a quantitative difference. This is a qualitative di difference. This is, a, I say arguably the worst human being on the face of the earth functionally in terms of his impact on the planet and on the people. And I, we just have to stop, stop mincing words about the terrible, terrible person that is calling the shots. Daryl, you want to say something? Daryl, yeah, we'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts on, on this. Um, you know, about uh, when to listen, when to act, when to talk. Uh, I, I know it's hard to hear me. I've, I've just got a phone and I'm outside and I'm technically challenged. But all I want to say is uh, the difference being made, I hope that everyone sees, is the involvement of, of white people actively uh, has made a significant difference and will continue to make a positive change that we will all see historically. Thank you for that. Yes. Right. Thank you. Okay, we have a question for uh, Joe Mar and Terry asking, this must be from folks down to our neighbors to the south. Are there equivalent organizations to yours with whom you work in Chicago? Um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, new to uh, Safe and Sound, so I'm uh, um, not too familiar if we have any connections with any peer organizations in Chicago at this point in time. Um, I know we work a lot with, um, with a, a, a drug prevention organizations throughout the, the Midwest, so I'm sure that there's some equivalent organizations that are doing some great things uh, similar to Safe and Sound within the Chicago region. 
ditto. <laughs> I don't have an, an exact. <laughs> I don't have an exact. Well, Megan and I have her. a lot of involvement in Chicago. In fact, we're there now. Yeah. And are, are there two or three organizations that you'd say are equivalent to Safe and Sound or the Alma Center, Paul or Megan? Well, you know, I'll throw it back to you, Pat, because I know the Center for Peacemaking, which you have not spoken of enough because you're being gracious and shining the light on Joe Mar and Terry and the great work that they're doing. Um, you have involvement in Chicago. Do you want to talk about that and about more generally what the center is doing? Sure. Well, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And, you know, as, as a moderator, I, I do think, and what's neat is, uh, you know, the center through our near West side work, we've collaborated with safe and sound and certainly Terry, we've collaborated with you over the years. You know, just in a nutshell, what the center strives to do is two things. One is form the next generation of peacemakers. So we're educating kids. They come, I shouldn't say kids, young adults who come to Marquette. We're trying to give them the skills, the values um, to go out and create a more equitable uh, society, whether it's here in Milwaukee or around the world. Um, and then we're trying to impact social conditions. And so we're working in the schools and the neighborhoods around Marquette and uh, countries around the world um, so that all people can thrive. And uh, some of the organizations that I've really um, admired, um, and now I might be blanking on the um, name, but there's a great restorative justice organization that does work both with law enforcement and public safety as well as in schools. And I believe it's called Sacred blood um but i think I'm, I'm messing up the name they're down on the far south side and then um you know i've also been really impressed with uh jessica dudley's organization in chicago that seems uh to be working to convene uh similar to what safe and sound does law enforcement the politicians and the community organizers to say as a group how do we increase our capacity um, and I think that there's still obviously a lot more work um, to be done and you know it's gets at another question I, I see uh, I believe Lynn you're joining us from Los Angeles and you're asking the question that's on a lot of people's minds not only how do we respond to the current events but what should we learn from them what what do these atrocities teach us? And you know, I think that's a good question for each of the panelists um, to to take a stab at. And then after that, we have a couple questions about the selections of uh, Steinbeck and the music. So I don't know if uh, maybe Paul, you could start us off with what do we learn from this, and then we'll quick. maybe do a lightning it's round. Super quick on it. Yeah. Um, also, want to do a quick shout out to not down here in Chicago, but about the same distance north, Harry M. Sydney, my brother's keeper. Uh, he's one of the organizations that the Last of Trust partners with, and we've done events together. He's a former Green Bay Packer, and uh, is using that notoriety and that connection uh, to do great male mentoring. Uh, in the Green Bay area and spreading out um, quite a ways beyond. Um, so uh, what, what we need to learn is empathy. You know, lately what I've been thinking, just, uh, the last 11 days especially, have been so um, painful. I feel like um, a lot of us have a thinner membrane right now, and maybe that's not a bad thing. I'm thinking about times when I've been clinically depressed and it's been almost impossible to walk past a homeless person, whether I give him a dollar or not because I am feeling it so vividly and my heart is breaking. And it's not good to be clinically depressed, but I think it is a good thing to develop an empathy that allows us, that no longer allows us to just keep moving. Um, and so I, I want all of us to learn empathy and to be thinking in terms of, oh my God, how terrible for that person this happened to, for their family members, for their friends, to people who are terrified when they find themselves in similar situations, we have to step outside ourselves. Steinbeck said, you don't turn inward, you turn to the people beside you, in front of you, behind you, below you, and lift them up. I think people need to uh, think about the fact that a, a lot of people will compartmentalize, they'll say, oh, it doesn't happen to me, so it doesn't affect me. And that is totally incorrect. <laughs> 
what happens to other people affects all of us. And the way we can learn what other people are going through is by listening and educating ourselves on those stories. Amen. Next. I can jump in. Um, I think what we were, what I'm really learning is that we, there is no stat, there is no going back to the status quo. I think the way that folks are reacting right now and what we're seeing is that you know we're we're fed up to the point of the system has to change. And we've been doing, we've been we've been needling around the edge of of changing in our institutions and our mindsets for 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 years. And I think right now there's a, a a wide opinion that we just we just can't go back to that same function and fashion. Um, there's going to have to be deep, significant change within these institutions for us to continue on the path forward, or else we're going to continue continue to see um, folks being angry, sad, frustrated, and protest until we get to that point. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree, Jamara. That's really what I was thinking. I remember three months ago when the um, when the NBA stopped the season and I was getting ready to go to the bus game and I was like, what? How can the NBA not be playing? You know, like, like this stuff that, that seemed so impossible. Like that's a, that's a kind of a, not a really super important example, but I use it because I think it, you like, wait, what? They're not gonna play, but they need to play. Right. And so to me- 50 years since our first, first and only championship it is important it's important but it what it did what it said to me and then everything kept it kept going like that like wait they're emptying the jails but they but a month ago they said everybody needed to be in jail but now they only want 50 percent of those people to jail wait they're not putting people in for violations but a, a month ago everybody needed to go in it just like it laid bare how made up yeah. and made up so much of the stuff that we are attached to is. And so I don't think it's even a, I hear what you're saying, Jamar and I agree it needs to change, but the system's not even broken. It's built this way. It's functioning the way that it was built. We need to reimagine the society that we need to re, that we need like, that we want to want to live in now. <laughs> like it's an opportunity to say, Hey, everything's laid bare. Let's let's create it. Let's put the blocks together and create it in the way that we want it to be. But let's also bring the box back. <laughs> let's, let's let them play and win the championship this year. Come on. It's it's leveling the playing field when everybody participates in a society that we all want to see. Thank you. Barbara um, pointing out. Uh, seeds of peace out of Hawaii. I think it's great to see such a wide network of people um, chiming in here uh, tonight. My computer is going a little slow, so I can't uh, scroll down right away um, to these other individuals. Um, and then I'll chime in with one last response to that question. And it's something I'm hearing from each of our panelists is people are echoing back to the great peacemakers, you know, it was um, Cesar Chavez who said to resist all things humiliating, that it's time to, to act. And, you know, it was certainly Dr. King who said that in the work that we should be doing, if we're doing it right, it should be building the beloved community. Um, and what I, I'm hearing from others, and, and I know is at the core of peacemaking, and, and, and certainly from our friends at the Congregation of St. Joseph, and, and some of the stuff Paul was mentioning, it's, you know, really identifying that we are one another's neighbors and brothers and sisters. And if we take seriously that, we, we truly will love one another and love our enemies. And, and, I, and, and I think, you know, that's what each of these organizations and each of you as artists are, are trying to remind us. Um, I'm glad to see a number of colleagues from Marquette chiming in here and like good academics, they want to know about uh, selections of text and uh, songs. So maybe, Paul, I think you were the primary uh, crafter of the script. Um, can you share a little bit about uh, what was the process to select the pieces of literature and the specific passages? Okay. This is in response to Jen Maney from the Center for Teaching and Learning at Mark. Thank you, Jen. Uh, yeah, I mean, I knew from the start almost 10 years ago when I started to put this together as a solo program, 
that when you do Steinbeck, it's going to be about empathy. It's going to be about social justice, inclusion, building the community. Um, and and I'm obviously Grapes of Wrath, obviously of Mice and Men. And uh, then uh, certain parts of Travels with Charlie are, are just so, the Deep South part is so social justice oriented, that's, that's a no brainer. And then to come to Cannery Row and say, okay, what, what is it? It's a little more subtle here. But when I read this and I see Henri the painter, this is someone who's so wrapped up in himself and his image that he is not able to extend himself for anyone and build a life and get in that boat and move forward. Um, and, and so that was kind of a eureka moment. Um, that's how I can use Cannery Row and then East of Eden. Um, it's it's a, a domestic situation and a multi-generational family situation, but it's driving home that same point where Brother's Keeper becomes very literal. And um, so, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, I had a connecting theme of this major element of Steinbeck that I wanted to bring out. And it came out more readily in some texts than in others, but it was there in everything. You'll find it in The Red Pony. You'll find it in Viva Sabata. You'll find it in everything of Steinbeck, I promise you. Um, because that's just who he was. And as for the songs, uh, the, the Springsteen one was easy. I, I knew the song and, and uh, it, it gives us a chance to get Tom Joad's voice into the piece because he's not in the scene that we do. Um, and, and, you know, it's just such a wonderful speech that he gives to his mother when he's fleeing the police and, and has to separate from his family. And he never does return, at least not within the, the narrative. Um, and then the other one, Cannery Row uh, song, uh, Delta 88 Nightmare. I just on as a friend, uh, John Doe, and X is my favorite band. And that, that song just came out on the new album in a new version. Uh, punk rock version about 300 beats per minute. We turned it into rockabilly, but um, it's about building beloved community. It's about, as I said, gentrification and displacement and going back to the place where the good memories um, uh, are founded and finding that the people uh, attached to them are gone because it's now a cute resort with dads and moms uh, staring at us and making fun. Um, but by the end, uh, there's a discovery that you have to look a little closer maybe, but some of those still, same people are still there. And uh, so uh, there is still the opportunity of reconnection in the community. Um, it was a lot of fun curia curating it uh, because I love Steinbeck and, and those two songs were inspired by him. My wife Heather says, and she's right, next time we should fold in uh, Woody Guthrie's uh, Ballad of Tom Show. It's kind of long because it summarizes the whole book, but maybe we could do it select in the book is that thick. Yeah. Well, I just want to extend my gratitude to you, Paul and Megan and Daryl, because it takes a lot of time for, to curate this, select the text, practice it, and, and the three of you just did a dynamite job. I know uh, we have folks on the East Coast where, where it's getting a little later, folks in Hawaii where maybe the sun hasn't set yet. Um, and really, it means a lot, I think, to you organization to know how many people from, from all across the country are tuning in. Um, one last question, and I might uh, turn it to the community partner after I answer myself, is um, you know, what crystallized hearing you know, the performance, hearing the songs and acted out, was there anything about the performance that was either an aha moment or maybe um, you know, a period of desolation or cancellation for you that you're um, still thinking about. And I'll uh, begin by answering that. And, you know, I just want to say that Illuminates did was just the, a reminder and how um, we constantly have to be cultivating new experiences for people. Because I had, like Megan, read a Sign back in high school, I think I, I dragged myself through it. A couple of years ago, I happened to be in Monterey. I reread Cannery Row, but I have to say, the experience of hearing it aloud, seeing people, you know, um, Daryl, your moving performance as crooks, it, it humanized it in a new way, which just solidified for me that at the core of change is you can't tell people how to think, you have to give them new experiences. and. Um, you know, that's what I'm taking away from the show. And, and I know the center is going to keep trying to do for young people in Milwaukee. But Terry, Jomar, um, would love to hear your opinions as we wrap up here. 
Uh, I can jump in first, Enter. Um, I think one of the things that really crystallized from the performance was that whole idea of loneliness. And I, I'll tell a story just about um, during the pandemic, we, we, we switched to, we, you know, we, at Safe and Sound, we normally do door-to-door -door conversations with our residents. We're out in the neighborhoods talking with kids or residents. And that really had to, had to change because of the pandemic. So we switched to, you know, a lot of virtual conversations and a lot of analog, you know, just picking up the phone and calling the residents that we, we have and checking on them. And we found that a lot of a lot of folks, you know, during this, the stay at home orders and, you know, just the, the, the COVID that folks were really lonely. Folks did not. They lost that sense of community during that time. And it just really crystallized me, crystallized with me as we were listening to this today, that importance of community, the importance of connectedness and being in the fabric of community, which, you know, um, we we had we we've lost over these past several months through the pandemic, and you know I think we've we've lost it as a community. If you really think about you know that connectedness between the races, connectedness um, bet about justice. So there's so many things that are creating loneliness within our society right now that we really need to get back to a sense of community. Um, or if we ever had a sense of community, how do we create a sense of community? Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. I'm so glad that you went first because I was like, it was the loneliness. Daryl Allen's performance of the loneliness and the isolation was just like, oh, gut-wrenching because it certainly has been such a profound experience right now, but then to connect it up with all of, you know, historically how that has been created, um, that that seems like the challenge, part of the challenge of our times. And wow, if we can overcome that, like really, really, um, focus on how we connect with each other for real connect, you know, like it's weird because even though we did a lot of all of the in-person, it's almost like these kind of connections have allowed people to actually like bear their soul in different ways too, that we were, it was been really surprising. Like, Oh, if you're not sitting right next to me, you're able to <laughs> give it all to me. So, <laughs> so I think we're learning to be creative in, our connections as well. So, um, yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much. And I'm going to invite each of the panelists to maybe, uh, I know everyone else is probably clapping at home, but I just want to give a round of applause to Megan, Paul, and Daryl. You three did a fantastic job, and, and, and you, I think, certainly some curiosity joe Maher, terry both of you are on the front lines doing great work in milwaukee thank you for everything you do and thank you to everyone who joined us tonight um each of these organizations are small we're nimble we're collaborative and we can't do it alone and i know that when i look at the names on who are here tonight i know all of you are intimately involved with the different organizations and just want you to know that your support, your uh, not only your financial support, but you know those kind words that were coming through on the chat tonight. That's what keeps us going, and we're just really grateful. And um, just like we were a year ago, we all remain committed to working to end racism and creating a more just and equitable society. So thank you, and thanks again to our performers. Everyone, have a good night. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Terry, thanks, Joe. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Love you all. I preached for the Lord a mighty long time. Preached about the rich and the poor. Us working folks is all get together because we ain't got a chance anymore. We ain't got a chance anymore. Now the deputies come and Tom and Casey run To the bridge where the water run down But the vigilante thugs hit Casey with a club They laid preacher Casey on the ground Poor Casey, they laid preacher Casey on the ground Tom Jode, he grabbed that deputy's club Hit him over the head Tom Joe took flight in the dark rainy night And a deputy and a preacher lying dead Two men, a deputy and a preacher lying dead Tom run back where his mother was asleep 
He woke her up out of bed And he kissed goodbye to the mother that he loved Said what preacher Casey said Tom Joad He said what preacher Casey said Everybody might be just one big soul Well it looks that a way to me Everywhere that you look in the day or night That's where I'm a gonna be Ma, that's where I'm a gonna be Wherever little children are hungry and cry Wherever people ain't free Wherever men are fighting for their rights That's where I'm a gonna be Ma, that's where I'm a 